keep going. You know, I've been teaching about the covenants, and I started, I didn't have a beard, and I've been going so long, now I have a beard. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I'm hoping you guys, are, we're done with the covenants of Abraham. So, the, the, and my message title has always been God of the Covenants. God is a covenant-making God and a covenant-keeping God. Amen. You and I are living in the new covenant, and he's keeping that intact for us. The seven major covenants that we've, we're going through are the covenant that he made in Eden with Adam, then the Adamic covenant after the fall, and then the covenant he made with Noah. We just did the Abrahamic covenant, which had a lot of neat stuff in it, a lot of truths that still to this day um, are, are in operation, that the blessings of Abraham may come upon us. Uh, we're going to start the covenant that God made with David, then we have the Mosaic covenant, and then the last one will be the New covenant. And so as we went through the um, Abrahamic covenant, we see how God approached Abram and promised to bless him in, in, in uh, Genesis 12. And then through that, God called out for himself a special people. This is the point where God called out a people group for himself, and today we know them as the Jews um, still intact today. And, uh, and through that people group, the whole earth would be blessed. That's what God said to Abram. Through you, all the people of the earth will be blessed. And that's one of the reasons I like the idea that the United States of America has, has got Israel's back. That, that we know that those that bless them will be blessed and those that curse them will be cursed, is what God told Abram. Um, and so then we, we see that um, from Genesis 12 to Genesis 22, we looked at how God called Abram out of the land of Ur. And in Genesis 22, where we ended the last time, we see the sacrifice of Isaac, which actually wasn't the sacrifice of Isaac. He was spared, and the ram was the, um, was the sacrifice that Abram made. And... Um, it's interesting because we see in Genesis 15, 6 was the first time in all of human history that a man was declared righteous by faith. Genesis 15, 6 said, And Abraham believed, and God accredited to him as righteousness. Because he believed what God said, he was put in right standing with God. And that's the same thing it is for us. And... Um, so for me, as we went through that, the study of the Abrahamic covenant, I saw that God's ability to keep his covenant is more powerful than my ability to mess it up. Because we know that Abraham had many opportunities to mess up the covenant. Thankfully, God had created a covenant that was one-sided, and it was all up to God to keep it. And that's why God is a covenant-making God and a covenant keeping God. Amen. And so now we're going to go on and um, look at the covenant God made with David. And so for those of you, I'm just going to kind of do a quick overview about some of the things that King David's, uh, about King David. Um, David was from the tribe of Judah. Uh, David was Ruth and Boaz's great grandson. That I did not know. David was the youngest of eight sons. David was from Bethlehem. David was anointed king while Saul was still on the throne. David was a shepherd, which most of us know. Um, David was a musician. Uh, he was a great warrior and a giant slayer. Uh, David was a man after God's own heart, and he is the only person referred to that way in the Bible. There's nobody else referred to as a man after God's own heart. And David wrote about half of the book of Psalms. And so that's a kind of a quick synopsis of who David is. As we get into this looking at this covenant God made with David, I thought it would be good for us to know who this was. Who is this David? And so we're going to take off in 1 Samuel 16, verses 1 through 13. Uh, I'm just going to read through them real quick. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul, who was king at the time, since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? 
Fill your horn with oil and go, and I will send to you Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. So this is the tension going on right now with Saul as king. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord, and invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me him whom I declare to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him, trembling, and said, Do you come peaceably? And he said, Peaceably. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he consecrated Jesse and his son and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height or his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by. And he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. I should... I should be having Corey up here saying these names. He probably, I'd probably slaughter him. But anyways, um, Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen these. And then Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest. But behold, he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and get him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was, a ruddy, he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed down upon David from that day forward. And Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. And so here we see... Um, God choosing the next king. Um, so one of the things, if we back up a little bit, we see that King Saul was chosen not because of God's choice, be because the Israelites had noticed that all the other nations had kings. And so they cried out to God for a king. And God said, not really my best desire for you guys. I want me to be your king. But if you want a king, all right, here's a king. And they picked Saul. And that's where a lot of the trouble started. Amen. It's, it's just like at Mount Sinai when God said uh, to Moses, bring my people to me. I want to talk to them. And the people said to Moses, no, we don't want this relationship with God we want a different relationship with God. Instead of father-son relationship, we kind of want a boss-employee relationship. And that's the reason the Ten Commandments were given. It was never God's idea to give the Ten Commandments. He didn't want to be a boss. He wanted to be a father. But in his great plan, he made it where the people would come back looking for a father and, and get rid of the boss. Amen. Um, and so we see that it was never God's plan to have a king, but since there was a king... Then, then God worked with them in that regard. And um, so uh, we see in verse 6. No, let me go on here. Um, oh, yeah. And, and so um, in verse 6. Let me get to it. When he came, he looked at uh, Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointing is before him. And it's interesting that, you know, so often we have this tendency to use outward appearances. What would seem to be the best for the situation outwardly. And, and it's interesting because God says no in verse 7. Um, but the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. 
And isn't it interesting, he's choosing the next king, he's setting up the next king, and what is that king known for? Being a man after God's own heart. Amen. And as we go forward and look at this in the life of David, we'll see that David was like his ancestor Abraham. He knew how to mess things up too. But thank God he's a covenant-making God and a covenant-keeping God. You and I ought to be able to just exhale and rest in the fact that God is well able to see us through. Amen. And, and so often, you know, we don't understand that he takes the foolish things of the world and confounds the wise. And he takes the weak things of the world to confound the strong. You know what I mean? Who would ever thought that this ex-drug addict, ex-alcoholic, ex-convict would be standing before you today teaching the word of God? You know, the world, if they were to look at most of our resumes, would have said, this one's out, yeah, this one's out, you know. And it's the same thing when Jesus went through and gathered the 12 around him. You know, think of Saul, wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. He's the apostle of grace. Look at his resume, murderer, you know. Really? That's, but see, God glorifies himself through these things. And so as we're getting ready to see David become the next king, God is trying to show them, hey, listen, Samuel, don't look at the outward appearance. Don't look at the things that you think are going to work. Let me choose the next person. And, and it's interesting because you don't know if the person sitting next to you right now is the next person that God's going to reach down and touch to go do something mighty for the kingdom. You know, we're, we're all of nature in class. We're all learning and growing in grace and growing in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then as you get to that point, God says, all right, you're ready now. You're ready to step out and go fulfill that which I've called you to do. Amen. So be prepared. Remember, we're full of gifts. He filled us full of the gifts, and the gifts are to be used. The gift that's not given is not of much value. Um, and so it's interesting, like I said, that, that I would have never guessed that I was one, and, and I pushed back against it for a while. And it's really interesting in my life, and of course, you know, each day makes up the month, and each month makes up the year, and each year makes up your life. And, and when you look back, when I look back at what God did in my life, so I get out of prison, and I've got this gift, this teaching gift in me, but I've got more zeal than I have wisdom. And so the pastor that I was under kind of brought me out ahead of time. And I'm thankful that the Holy Spirit caused me to back up because I could have got myself in probably some trouble because, like I said, I had way more zeal than I had wisdom at that time. And so thankfully I backed up a little bit and then came through the class to the point where I needed to be. So... You know, don't let mankind push you out if you're not ready to go out. The peace of God will be there when the time comes. Amen. But also understand that you're never going to get to the place where you're fully persuaded you're able. Because one thing about God, if, if what he's asked you to do isn't bigger than yourself, then you don't need him. Right? You don't have to operate by faith because you think you've got the strength and the wisdom and the ability to do it yourself. And I'm telling you, that's a dangerous place to be. When you don't fall before the Lord and say, but for the grace of God, there goes I. Amen. And so now in verses 8 through 10, we see that all of Jesse's sons come before the prophet. And one by one, he says, no, this isn't the one, this isn't the one, this isn't the one, this isn't the one. And, and, and um, so we get to that place where, in verse 11, oh, I, one thing I want to make a point of, we must understand that there was nothing wrong with the seven other sons of Jesse. There was nothing wrong with those seven boys. They just weren't the chosen one. They were not chosen to do what God was looking for at that time. They weren't, they weren't um, 
disqualified from it. They just weren't qualified for it. Amen? So there's nothing wrong with those um, if, if that's not the person God has chosen. And God has chosen one. He told Samuel, from the family of Jesse, from the sons of Jesse, there's going to be a king come. And so we get to the place then in verse 11 where uh, then Samuel said to Jesse, are all your sons here? I'm sure he was like, wait a minute, we went through the sons and God has not told me that any of these are to be the next king. Um, and, and, he's, and Jesse said, there remains yet the youngest, but behold, he is keeping the sheep. So there's a shepherd boy. He's out tending the sheep. Um, and Samuel said to Jesse, send and get him, for we will not sit down until he comes. Um, and so, like I said, Samuel knew there had to be one of these boys. And so finally Samuel sends for David to come. And it's, I love what it says here. And he sent and brought him in. And now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. Now, what do those three things say about him? They were all outward things. But he just told us he doesn't look at the outward appearance. He looks at the heart. But see, the two can go together. See, the other ones had the outward appearance, but David had the heart. David had the heart. You know, and as we look at David's story of how when he was out tending the sheep, how he trusted on God and spent time with God and God helped him kill the lion and kill the bear and protect the sheep. He had a very close relationship with God out there in the field, you know. And, um, and then the Lord says, I, so that word ruddy, I looked that up. It says, having a healthy red color. David was a healthy young man. But here do we have to understand, in, in all of the research I did, at this point, David was somewhere between 10 and 15 years old. A lot of them leading towards 15, but, but some said that between 10 and 15 years old is how old David was. Amen? And, and so, you know, don't despise your youth. God, is, God will raise you up at 10, at 20, at 30. It doesn't matter. If God's anointing is upon you, it doesn't matter how old you are. Amen? You're... Your, your young ones will dream dreams, and the old ones will have visions. Amen. And so uh, I, I like it here because it, it gives us a, a little bit of a description of David. He had beautiful eyes and, and was handsome. So, so here's this young man now, and he's brought before Samuel, and the Lord said, um, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Finally, the seventh son, or the eighth son of Jesse is there, the youngest. And, and I laugh because when Jesse said, hey, there is one more, but he's a shepherd kid. He's out in the field with the sheep. We don't even pay attention to that young kid. He's out just, you know, walking in the pastures with the sheep. And, and so here's the interesting part about anointing. So, you know, you and I have probably been in services where they anoint your forehead. And, but... When God started out and spoke to Samuel, and he said to Samuel, How long do you grieve over Saul since I have rejected him? Fill your horn with oil. So they took a ram's horn, made a, a, like a brass cap on the end of it with a lid, and they would fill it with oil. And so when Samuel now anointed David with oil, it wasn't just a little tap on the forehead or across. They literally poured the oil and would run down. It was an event. Your life was changed when this oil was poured on you. He was anointed to do this work. And, and I've got to imagine all of the thought processes that were going through David's head at this time. What is going on here? I'm the one. You've chosen me. Just a shepherd boy. Um, and so we see that he gets anointed with oil. And then verse 13 said, And then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And I got thinking about, now here are all the older brothers. Of course, Samuel has walked by all of them. And in comes this ruddy-faced, 
young kid, and he's the one? I'm sure them seven brothers are going, what the? God chose that kid? He's a shepherd boy, you know? And, and they didn't, they've never read the scripture that God takes the foolish things of the world to confound the wise and the weak things of the world to confound the strong. And so here's David now, and he gets anointed with lots of oil. And here's the neat part about it. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward, and Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. And one of the things that you need to know about the Old Covenant Holy Spirit is he came upon the kings, the prophets, and the priests. And he came upon them that they would do the work of the Lord. And then when the work was done, the Holy Spirit left. And that's why David wrote, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. You know, and too often in the new covenant, they're praying, oh, Lord, you know, I've sinned. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. We should rejoice in the fact that when the Holy Spirit comes and fills us, he's there for good. He's not flimsy or falter. He, he's there with us. Amen. And, well, think about it. He's the one that brings us to that day where we're, we're spotless, without spot. So I've got to imagine that when the Holy Spirit came upon him, it was a feeling he'd never known before. The empowerment of God was there. The wisdom of God, the strength of God was there to produce what he needed to be what he was called to do. But you and I are in such a better covenant. I mean, wonderful to have the Holy Spirit come upon you, even greater to have the Holy Spirit come and live in you. Amen. How much greater. And so from that day forward is when the Holy Spirit would come upon David to do the work that he was called to do. And I'm gonna, we're going to stop the video right now. Hold on, Tim, and don't stop it quite yet. Did you stop it? Okay. I just want to tell anybody that will be watching this video right now, we are going to go listen to Ray Bolt's song, The Shepherd Boy. So if you're watching this on video, go to YouTube and find the song right now and listen to it. Amen. Do we have to stop it or something?